Want to improve your self-confidence? We recommend Short North Dental for your whitening, tightening, and brightening needs. From cleanings to Botox, treat yourself to a great smile. Check out the newest gallery in the Arts District at shortnorthdental.com because dentistry has never looked this good. Sugar Ray Leonard, Roberto Duran, Marvelous Marvin Hagler, and Thomas Hearns. Legends, whose four-way rivalry defined one of the greatest eras in boxing history. Relive their decade of dominance in a new Showtime sports documentary, The Kings, a four-part series now streaming on Showtime. Welcome to the Boneyard with Steve Robertson. As always, I am your good friend and host, Steve Robertson, here on the Maroon Friday edition of The Yard. Hope you're wearing Maroon today. It's a big weekend for Mississippi State. It's a super regional weekend. We're going to break down our opponent, Notre Dame. We're going to break down the super regionals around the country. We're going to get you guys completely prepared for this weekend. And then it's great that we can celebrate Maroon Friday in this country however we choose. Again, I hope you're wearing maroon today. I hope that you rep it all the time, but uh, especially this weekend, team needs some good vibes. Got a really good opponent coming in here. Listen, there are a lot of people out there really high on Notre Dame. I'm not. I think they're a really good team. I don't think they're a great team. I don't think they deserve nearly the press they've gotten from some people in the National College of Baseball media. But we can all just still agree to disagree and still be friends. I, I think that they are a tad overrated. And I'm glad that the NCAA selection committee uh, kind of saw through some of that and said, hey, let, let's not reward them for not playing non-conference games. As I mentioned to you guys on the show a while back, it wasn't an ACC rule. They just selected not to play non-conference games, played four non-conference games. Meanwhile, Louisville – Played 12, 13. Miami played about a dozen. I mean, everybody else in the league's playing them. But Notre Dame's not. And I think it would have set a very bad precedent for the NCAA Division I committee to say, you know what, hey, let's go ahead and give them a top eight national seed when they dodged non-conference competition and then saved all of their arms for the weekend. And really, let's be honest, there's no, just, is it any wonder they won the ACC? And that's not to say they're not a good team. But, you know, if I've got all my arms available on the weekend, I better win. I mean, because what happens is you burn a couple of guys throughout the week. I mean, you have guys that start midweek games. You have guys that have to relieve midweek games. But if I don't play them, then there's less wear and tear on my arms. I got more guys available on a weekend. So when things start going south, I've got more options. So I think it's rather cowardly, to be honest with you. People say, well, you know, Steve, they had this and had that. No, 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 they didn't. No, they absolutely did not. It was a choice that they made as, a, as an athletic department not to play these games. And so they can be angry, and I understand some of them are angry. And you know what? That's completely okay. Because I don't fault those young men. I don't fault the players. They didn't make a schedule. They didn't make the decision not to play these games. And so I don't want it to get misconstrued that I'm being critical of the players. But you know, an administration that basically eliminates – you know, a dozen games or more from the schedule and then expects to be rewarded for that by getting a top eight national seed is a complete joke. It absolutely is. But I want to read you guys something. Maybe you're unaware of this. Maybe maybe, maybe you know. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, you know, a lot of people are well aware of, um, you know, Notre Dame's, uh, you know, big star there. I mean, uh, how could you not be after the weekend he had last weekend in the regional? Notre Dame first baseman, Nico Cavadas, hit five home runs in the regional last weekend. That's a heck of a weekend. And they feasted on some bad pitching. They did. And, uh, you know, give them credit for doing that. But uh, it wasn't like they were, you know, facing major competition. But, um, you know, Cavadas made some comments that uh, have gone kind of gone viral. Maybe you're unfamiliar with them. But um, – he says, hey, we feel like this next weekend should have been here, talking about the Super Regional. That's going to light a fire under us, and we're going to find a way to go into Mississippi State and go 2-0. That's what he said. Now, maybe he's caught in the moment. You know, maybe that's what they're using to kind of, you know, drive the train up there is the disrespect thing, and nobody likes us, and we win the ACC, and we still didn't get to be a top eight national seed. And, you know, listen – a lot of coaches out there use that. They got to keep a chip on your shoulder. You know, I get it. I still don't know that I would have said that in the paper. It's one thing to say it in the locker room. It's another thing to say it to reporters. And so, of course, those, uh, you know, those, those comments have, uh, have been circulated. And, uh, matter of fact, I shared them myself. 
I think it's important to know that stuff. I mean, it just, you know, I think it is. And so, you know, people say, well, you know, they were an angry team. And, you know, listen, they had Michigan in their, their regional, who was the last place team, the last team to get into the regional. And many people thought they were undeserving. I was one of them. I think their RPI was 88. But, you know, it's like the Big Ten usually gets four, four and a half, five teams. I guess it's impossible to get four and a half. But, you know, my point, they get four or five teams every year. It wasn't a great year in the Big Ten. So they pushed the team in, and, you know, and so it's Michigan, and Michigan didn't do anything. UConn's a team that a lot of people early on, kind of the baseball hipsters, thought would be a really good G5 team. I mean, they got some prospects on that team, but they didn't do anything. I mean, it's ridiculous when you go back and look at the numbers in that regional. I mean, Notre Dame arguably had the easiest regional. You know, in hindsight, you look back and say, you know, you give them credit for, for taking advantage of the competition available to them, but you've got – you know, some really bad teams in your regional, you better go blow them out. And they did. But I, my honest opinion is, is I think we're going to see the ACC Notre Dame more so than the NCAA regional Notre Dame. I think they come back to earth a little bit, and they're kind of more of who they really are. Not to mention you're on the road this year. I mean, you're on the road this weekend. So we're going to break Notre Dame down in, you know, very extensively here in just a little bit, but I, I want to get into uh, looking at the other supers because, you know, th- those all start on Friday. You know, so we're going to have four to start Friday, four to start Saturday. So we're going to go ahead and look ahead. And I'm excited, man. I mean, it's one of those things, too, as much as I want to go ahead and play, I'm kind of excited to have that day. You know what I'm saying? That day to kind of watch it all unfold on Friday, and that'll get me more excited for Saturday. And I really think, too, us having the Saturday super – it's really good for us considering that we really extended Will Bednar and Christian McLeod longer than we have, at least pitch count-wise, than we have at any point in the season. And that's one of the reasons you manage them the way you do early in the year is you want to have a little fuel left in the tank. When we went to Omaha back in 19, I mean, Ethan Small was pitching on fumes. The guy's a competitor. But he just didn't have the same stuff he had earlier in the year. And so we managed things a little bit different. Coach Foxhall, I thought, did a great job kind of howling that early on. I know some people are thinking, man, you know, look at Vanderbilt and Ole Miss. You know, they're going, you know, seven, eight innings with their guys in the non-conference. Well, you know, and then some of their guys are unavailable now that it's time that we're uh, competing to go to Omaha. And so I think you look the gift of hindsight shares with us that uh, Coach Fox Hall did it right. I don't think there's any question. You know, we're good to go. We're ready to go. We hadn't lost any of our starters, you know, to injury. You know, we hadn't had to shut anybody down. This year, you know, there have been some other people that have missed starts and that sort of stuff uh, down the stretch. You know, Will Bednar, of course, lost one early in the year with some uh, neck stiffness, but uh, and Sarantola missed it because they didn't make the trip. But you kind of understand my point, is that our arm care management program is clearly superior to some other teams around the league because our guys appear to be pitching their best baseball down the stretch. And listen, throw Hoover out. Okay, throw it out. I, and nobody will ever admit this, but I, I just don't believe we went over there ready to play. I think we went over there and thought, you know what, the hay's in the barn. Let's go over there and get out and come on home. And we did. It was embarrassing, but that's what happened. So I don't, I don't hold those Hoover starts against anybody, and nor should you. So we'll get into that. We'll get into uh, a great top ten list. It's my pick today, and, you know, Fridays, it's rock and roll day. It's rock day. But today is not a band. Today is a year. That gives you a little, a little hint there. Today is a year. Well, thank our good friends at Bulldog Burger Company. Listen, if you're looking for employment, a lot of you students, a lot of people have reached out and said, hey, listen, on social media, if you know anybody that's hiring, let me know. Well, Bulldog Burger Company is right here in Starkville and then also at Bulldog Burger Company in Tupelo, the new location in Richmond, of course, just kind of getting up to speed as well. So if you're looking for employment, and you want to be part of a great organization that does a great job, Bulldog Burger Company is absolutely the way to go. I I can personally attest to this because my nephew Dan worked there, and he loved it, hated to leave. I almost thought he might hang around and go to grad school so he could keep working there. I mean, they they treated him really, really well. Matter of fact, uh, the day that Dan got married here a couple weeks ago, I got a message from uh, John Bean from Bulldog Burger Company and says, hey, please offer uh, Dan our best. And so great people. And listen, it is not just a great place to work. It is a tremendous place to eat. 
Go by there, find your own favorites. Go by and check them out right here on University Drive in Stark Vegas, Gloucester Street and Tupelo, and then Lake Harbor Drive there in Ridgeland. Easy to find, man. It's great. Have the spring rolls. They'll make you and everybody around you better look, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. We all need more of that. Some of us need it more than others, including yours truly. I don't have all these tattoos and long hair for nothing. Uh, so go by, check them out. Bulldog Burger Company, the place where people go to meet. M E A T. All right, so all the action gets underway later today on the left side of the bracket. That's the Arkansas side of the bracket. Of course, we're on the Texas side of the bracket. I guess if we want to be homers, we can call it the Mississippi State side of the bracket. So the left side is the Friday day, the Friday uh, series. It began today, if I can ever get that out. So we'll start at the top of the bracket, Arkansas playing NC State. You know, I like Arkansas here. And it's not because I don't think NC State's a good team. I think the I think the ACC is above average this year. I don't think it's a great year in the ACC. I know some people have suggested that. I think the first round of the tournament kind of shows that um, you know there wasn't the depth in that league perhaps that we thought. But I do think NC State is a team that's capable of going up there taking the game. But it is so difficult to beat Arkansas in their ballpark. I mean that team is built for that park. They've got a lot of left-handed hitters. They got the short porch and right. It is a tremendous baseball atmosphere. If you've never been, uh, you should go. Be careful wearing maroon, though. <laughs> nah, it's not that bad. But, uh, yeah, it's a good time. But here's the deal. In Arkansas, it's, it's just like at Mississippi State, where if you're unfamiliar with playing in front of those crowds, and listen, I get it, I've played with big crowds before. There's a big difference between 4,000 people and then 12,000 people or 10,000 people. It's a big difference. And very few of those people are rooting for you. you got a few fans there, and they're kind of scattered around. Your mom dad's over there behind the dugout. You boot that ball around because the crowd got to you. You can look up there and blow her a kiss. But, you know, it is a difficult place to play. It's been a difficult place for us to play over the years. And they've done a great job there. Dave Van Horn's done a great job cultivating a program there. It comes in from Nebraska and Arkansas. It had been a good team, but uh, he's made them an elite team, the team that we've had to kind of contend with here the last few years. And so I have a respect for them. I hate losing to them. I know some people say, oh, I mean, you guys hate Arkansas. I don't hate Arkansas. I like it when they lose because, you know, we're chasing them for an SEC championship. But it's not anything personal for me. I do respect them as a program. I respect Dave Van Horn as a coach, even though there are some times I've, I've heard some stories and conversations that he's had that, uh, that are, you know, probably not conversations I'd want to have with him, even when he came to Starkville. But I like Arkansas at home. I think in order to beat Arkansas, you're going to have to get them at Ameritrade. I think you got to get them in that big ballpark with the wind blowing in just a little bit. I don't think they have elite pitching. After what they do have, though, is tremendous defense. They are so incredibly strong up the middle with Christian Franklin in center and then, you know, Bob Moore there at second. I mean, they are really, really strong up the middle. And so if you're going to beat them, you got to hold them down offensively. And then you got to, you know, take advantage of your opportunities to manufacture some runs. I mean, you, I just don't think your team, you, you can be able to go up there and not slug them. But one of the things I think is interesting is people say, well, you know, Steve, you keep talking about that big ballpark. Well, let, let's take a little closer look at something here, okay? So they beat up a pretty average Georgia team the first day of the SEC tournament pretty good. I mean, they, re- they really did. They got after them pretty strong, 11-2 ball game there. You know, just kind of looking at some numbers here, too, because I think it's important to kind of look and see how this, this ball game actually went. You know, for the most part, they kept them in the yard. I mean, there were a couple of home runs. I guess um, uh, Georgia had one. They had a home run in the ball game, and uh, Arkansas had one. But that's it. You know, it wasn't like they're out there playing, you know, home run derby like they were against us when they came in here. And so you just have the one home run from them. And so they kind of beat up, you know, Georgia because, you know, Georgia was kind of beat up down the stretch too. You remember Ole Miss went in there and really got the better of them too in that final series in Athens. Georgia kind of limped to the finish line, as you guys are well aware. Well, then you get into Vanderbilt. Now, granted, you're going to be, you know, playing Vanderbilt, right? But you win a ball game, it's a 6-4 ball game. It's a manageable score. Saturday, you play Ole Miss, it's a 3-2 ball game. And so what happens here is you start keeping people in the yard, and you got to play a little baseball. you got to play a little baseball. And that's the thing that I look at when I get excited about this is like, you know, you look at this Arkansas-Vanderbilt game, 
You know, the one home run hit in that ball game was hit by Vanderbilt. Arkansas didn't hit a home run. And so these teams that are dependent on the long ball, those teams struggle in Hoover and, and Omaha. You, know, you, you got to go out there and play baseball. It's not a, a beer league softball game. And so l- launch angle teams tend to struggle at TD Ameritrade. The numbers bear that out. You know, the wind blows out earlier in the year, but by the time you get into the spring, it's a much different deal. So, you know, I think Arkansas is vulnerable. I do think they are the best team in the country, but I don't know if it is a great matchup for them at Omaha. I just – I don't know if they fit that park the way that some other people would, uh, you know, would hope. And I don't think they've got front-line pitching, so they're going to get hit a little bit. But I think you just got to keep them in the yard – and play good defense. And uh, let's take a quick look back to uh, at the last time we all went to Omaha, which is back in 19. And um, listen, you know, Arkansas was a really good team that year too. You know, I mean, we we know this. We went up there and they swept us, right? And uh, we were looking forward to playing them. But, you know, we took a little glee in the fact that they were the first team eliminated. But let's just go back and look at those numbers. Because, you know, their record this year is not much different than it was then. So they go down to – and they play Florida State and get beat one nothing. That's right, one nothing. And then they lose to Texas Tech in their second game, 5-4. So they go to Omaha and play two games and score four runs. I'm not saying it's going to be that way this year, but I think those scores are going to be a lot lower it's because I don't think they're built for that park. I think they're built really well for their park. And they play really well in offensive parks because they swing it. They're dependent on a long ball. But I think they're vulnerable in Omaha. I just hope we get a chance to play them. Really, really do. Because <laughs> it means you're playing for a NAFL championship. All right, let's look at uh, that second part of the uh, the bracket there. i got about 20 tabs open right now, so you have to be patient with me here. So, I like Arkansas to beat NC State. I'm going to call it two games to one, Arkansas. Texas Tech and Stanford, to me, this is the most intriguing super regional on that side of the bracket. I mean, it really is. Because, okay, Stanford is a team that has only lost a one-weekend series. They have struggled to find a third starter. But they're going to play Texas Tech, who is one of the top offensive teams in the country in their own ballpark. And so something's got to give. You know, Stanford's had some really good pitching. They hadn't always been the most offensive club. But Texas Tech has been. Yeah, Texas Tech is, I mean, they're, they're one of these great teams that is really kind of built for their park, too. 86 home runs on the year. 86, which is tied for ninth. And just to get, let me put this in perspective for you guys, too, because a lot of times people always equate, you know, home runs with winning. You know, because chicks dig the long ball, right? I mean, that's what we all were all told as kids, right? That, well, you know, that don't always win. Let me run down the top ten here for you. So, uh, some of these teams no longer playing. Some are. The team that led the nation in home runs, Old Dominion, out of the tournament. Then there's Arkansas second. Dallas Baptist is third at 97. That's a bit of a surprise. Number four, Mercer, didn't make the tournament. Tennessee at 92. Um, they're obviously still in. Wake Forest, 91, not in the tournament. Kansas State, 89, not in the tournament. LSU, uh, kind of a sympathy pick in the tournament, 88. Auburn with 86, didn't make the tournament. And so, just because somebody has a ton of home runs doesn't mean they win a ton of ball games. So, you see, it's really it's really kind of a mixed bag there. But I like Texas Tech, man. I like Timmy Tadlock's approach to offense. I think they're a team that's really, really tough in their park. And I think Stanford is uh, probably not going to be able to, to score with them. And I do think Texas Tech will score. Now, that's not to say – the Texas Tech doesn't have some issues. They do. They have some swing and miss. But I like them to take a series. Probably, you know, maybe a, a two two games to one deal. Probably goes to full three games. I think that's probably fair, you know. Um, you, you know, and just looking at a couple things here, like looking, you know, batting average, because I think this is another statistic, too, a lot of people look at. And there are some people in our state that will beat you up with that statistic and then that they excuse the fact that they had a losing month. But, uh, you know, Wright State led the country in batting average and San Diego State, UNLV. I mean, what's what's three, what three things those guys have in common? None of them are still playing baseball. 
Arizona still in the, the tournament. Jackson State, Nirvana, Marist, Illinois, Chicago, Alabama State, New Mexico, Louisiana Tech. Uh, what do those teams have in common outside of Arizona? They're not. They're not playing. Bryant, Western Carolina, Campbell was 14. Fairfield, Baylor, Air Force, UTSA, Washington State. I mean, listen, there's one team in the top 20 that's still playing baseball. One. One team in the top 20 of batting average is still playing baseball. It's an, it's, is it an anomaly or is it, does it teach us anything? I think it teaches us something. You've got, you got to be more than just being an offensive team. You've got to be able to go there and get people out. Uh, but I like Texas Tech. I like their offense. And I think the fact they're playing at home – to be a partisan crowd there. I like Texas Tech to take it two out of three. Uh, the third regional is one that uh, people will be paying a lot of attention to. And, again, I think this is a two-for-one deal. But I really like Arizona. I don't know if you guys noticed, but the uh, they say it's a dry heat. But the forecasted temperatures this weekend in Tucson is 105 to 111. That's a, that's a much different deal than we are used to here. That's humidity, guys. Much different deal. They say it's the drier air out there. I don't. I don't know. But 105 is 105. That's ridiculous, man. Uh, I, I you know, of course, Doug Nikhazy's going to throw on game two. I believe is what I read, and uh, Derek Diamond will throw game one. So, Ole Miss absolutely has to win game one because they're not going to win games two and three. They'll win. They should win game two with Nikhazy. But you know, as arm weary as he was, as much as he pitched last weekend. You know, who knows how deep he can go in a ball game. And I'm sure Arizona's kind of licking their chops thinking, if we get that Ole Miss bullpen, uh, we're going to win this thing. So, unless Ole Miss – Ole Miss needs to win Friday to win this tournament. To make it to Omaha, I think Ole Miss has to win Friday because I don't see them winning a game three. I just don't think they have anything left pitching-wise. And I know they'll throw McDaniels and, uh, and Myers out there. I just – you know, I think Arizona is simply too good offensively and in their ballpark. And, uh, I, you know, listen, Jay Johnson, those guys out of Arizona, they're not dummies. They, they've seen what Tim Elko has done. They're not going to go up there and throw that guy go for balls. They're not just going to go play baseball with him. They're not going to let him beat them. People forget Arizona played for a national championship just five years ago. This is a well-coached team. They're, they're a team that's obviously played exceptionally well this year. They won the Pac-12. Uh, that's a good baseball league. They didn't win it by accident. I like Arizona to win this series. I'm going to call it two for one, but I will not be surprised if Arkansas, if our Arizona sweeps. I won't be. And a lot of it's going to kind of hinge on what Doug McKenzie looks like in game two. He would look pretty vulnerable at times last weekend. Maybe you saw him pitch uh, with him two days rest, whatever whatever it was that brought him back, and Pete Pinch against Southern Miss and got rocked. You know, so we'll see. Again, it all goes back to arm management. You know, it's like. How much gas does he have left in the tank? And listen, of course he wants to get to Omaha, so I'm sure he's doing everything they told him to do this this week to get ready. But I could see Arizona taking them both. I think the ride ends for the Rebels this weekend. Probably two out of three, but I could see them getting swept. Vanderbilt and ECU, I see this as a 2-0 deal for Vanderbilt. I know there's a lot of people that are really high on ECU. I just don't think they got the horses. I mean, in their league, absolutely. They're great. But you're going to be going up against Kumar Rocker, and uh, Leiter clearly has found it again. You know, how are you going to patch that up? I mean, you know, Vanderbilt is kind of – Vanderbilt is built for a super. If you're going to beat Vanderbilt, it's got to be in that 14 bracket at Omaha. Because, you know, the competition in a regular regional is not good enough. But, you know, everybody's got frontline pitching when you get to Omaha. And so you don't have to beat them twice. You just have to have them lose twice. So you beat them once, and then all of a sudden somebody else plays them in a loser's bracket game, then they beat them, and they're out of the tournament. And so it's not as simple as, okay, well, we got to go win two out of three. You just got to beat them once and hope somebody else can pick them off. And, of course, they come back through the loser's bracket. You'd have to beat them a second time. But as they have shown, the depth in that pitching staff is virtually non-existent. Once you get to Maldonado, you know, they're pretty average. So – yeah, I mean, if they were on my side of the bracket, I'm sure Arkansas is thinking that way too. It's like, hey, listen, you know, if we, we play them in game two uh, in Omaha, we probably won't see them again until after probably, you know, the end of the weekend. And they're going to be throwing some midweek guy. We're going to be able to rock those guys. So I don't see Vanderbilt having any trouble. And I had said early on this year 
that I thought Vanderbilt was really vulnerable and they might not make it to Omaha. But I think based on the matchups, they'll make it. They'll make it. And so on the left side of the bracket, I have Vanderbilt, Arizona, Texas Tech, and Arkansas advancing. The, the only one that I'm really not sure about is that Texas Tech-Stanford one. I, I think that could be really, really interesting. I mean, we listen, we know what kind of program Stanford has. We played them two years ago. They, they weren't as good as us. But you know what? We were probably a better team back then, too, than we are today. But this Stanford team is intriguing. They really are. And the fact that uh, they only lost one weekend all year kind of makes you realize that they're going to be able to manage this thing pretty well. They'll just kind of go back in their regular routine. So we, I could see them taking the series. But I like Texas Tech at home. They're kind of like Arkansas at home. You know what I'm saying? They, they, know where all, they, they know where the holes in the fence are. You know, they just know. And I think they're a team that is so difficult to beat at their place. They're not a great road team, but they're awfully tough at home. All right, let's look at the other side of the bracket, the Mississippi State side of the bracket. We'll start with Texas. Uh, probably got uh, as good a draw as anybody because of the upset. And they could have placed Florida or Miami. Instead, they're playing South Florida. And you know what? Good for the Bulls, man. And it's good for the game of college baseball for somebody like South Florida to make the Supers. I don't give them any chance at all of beating Texas, especially in Austin. You know, Madden is just too good. That's a win right out of the gate. And if it goes into a game three, I just don't think USF is going to have the pitching. So I actually like Texas to sweep in two games. They Their pitching is really, really strong. And granted, granted, USF won the regional, but let's be honest, it's not a, a great Miami team. And Florida has underachieved this year. So it's not a surprise that Florida got upset based on what we know in hindsight. But South Florida has probably gone as far as they can go. Virginia and Dallas Baptist. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a call here, and, and maybe I'm not really calling out a turn here. Dallas Baptist is going to win this thing. There's a couple reasons that I would say this. Number one, I think Virginia is a team, but it's gotten hot late. I don't know if they can kind of sustain that. But Dallas Baptist has been good all year long. You know, Indiana State was right there on their heels the whole time through. And you said, well, see what's Indiana State. It's still in their league. It's comparable competition. You heard the home run numbers. You heard the batting average numbers. Dallas Baptist is an offensive team. And UVA does not get the benefit of a home field advantage. This is going to be played on a neutral side at Columbia, South Carolina. And so on a neutral field, I think you got to go with the more complete team, and that's Dallas Baptist. Dallas Baptist for years was kind of known more as a pitching team. That was kind of their calling card, right? And so now all of a sudden they've got the offense to go with it. And I heard it said earlier this week, I can't remember who said it, he said, you know, Dallas Baptist is an Omaha team that just hadn't done it yet. Now, getting to Omaha, I think, is going to probably expose a few chinks in the armor. Uh, but I like them this weekend. And I, I listen, I know Virginia gutted out that big win on Tuesday. It was an incredible ball game. It really was. But um, I think the road ends for them. I do think it goes three games, though. But I, I think, again, too, I think it's good for the game of baseball for Dallas Baptist to make it. Because in order for us to expand the game, in order for us to get more votes, for more funding, for more scholarships, and paying third, the third assistant, you need more teams like Dallas Baptist to break through. You just simply need that. Because that gives hopes to other teams around the country that are G5 schools. Say, so you know what? Hey, they can do it. We can do it. Coastal Carolina won an AFL championship. Fresno State won a national title. They're not traditional baseball powers. And so every so often, you, you need like a Gonzaga or a Boise State to kind of rise to the top every once in a while like they did in basketball or football. You need one of those mid-major teams to go out there and be successful to keep the rest of those leagues engaged. They can think, you know what, maybe that's us. If we spend some money on this, that could be us. But I really like this Dallas Baptist team. I like them to win that regional in Columbia. I do think the Hoos will have some fans there, but it won't be anything like what it would be if they were in uh, Charlottesville. I think the most intriguing series on this side of the bracket is Tennessee and LSU. Because of the bad blood we talked about, you know, and I think also, too, LSU has figured some things out 
I, I told you guys early in the year after we beat them, I wanted to play them early because they would would figure it out. It took a lot longer than I expected, and uh, Maneri and them made life difficult on themselves by not taking care of business in the month of May. Really expected them to stack up some wins, and they lost some games they shouldn't have. But uh, they have found something, and uh, you know maybe it's the fact that Maneri's retiring, they're playing for him or whatever. But they went up there and won that regional at Oregon, and uh, that, that was not a cake regional by any stretch. At which you had to travel, and they go in there, and uh, you know, not people were expecting a whole lot. They win the thing, and now they go back to play Tennessee, and that's the thing. When you go up there and get swept the way LSU did, and that was really the first, you know, first sign of, hey, there's a lot of problems here. Because everybody expected Mississippi State to be good. I think most people expected Tennessee to be pretty good, but not to be what they've become. And so that was a huge series win for Tennessee. They smacked LSU around a little bit, and I think everybody said, oh, I don't know how good that win was over LSU. Well, these younger guys have kind of grown up a little bit now, and, of course, they want to play well for Maneri, want to keep the ride going as long as they can. I do think the ride ends in Knoxville, but I do think LSU is going to go up there and just fight and fight and fight and fight. And I think it's going to be a very emotional and chippy series. I won't be the least bit surprised if there's not some guys – uh, they get thrown at. It's just part of the deal. But I do think that one goes three games, but I like Tennessee to advance. Now, I didn't mention Mississippi State. I was saving that one for last. I think Mississippi State's going to win a series, and I won't be surprised if we take it in two games. I do like – there's never been a formal announcement, but I do like the idea of, well, Bednar going first and then Christian McLeod going second. Now, if it gets into a game three, you know, Maybe you start Brandon Smith and then bring uh, Houston Harding in behind him. I like playing at our place, and I like the fact that we can kind of throw it out there and pitch it pretty well. And I've got some some interesting statistics to share with you a little bit later when we, we fully preview Notre Dame. But I like State to win this and get to Omaha. Now, am I a little bit nervous about it? Absolutely. Because there's always the unknown. You know, it's like you can look at the numbers and, and say, you know what, the teams are pretty comparable, but the competition they played against really isn't. But this Notre Dame team is good, and they are angry. They are motivated. They feel like that they were um, conspired against, I guess you could say. Uh, but the bottom line is this. Is you you, you got to go play the ball games. It doesn't matter what's said in the paper. It's what happens in between the lines. And they went out there last weekend and feasted against some very average pitching, and that's what they won't get. But if Mississippi State can keep them in the yard, and there's really only one guy you got to worry about. We'll talk about that later in the show. But – yeah, if we go out there and don't boot the baseball around, we made one error last weekend. We got to do the same thing this weekend. We got to do that or better. We got to play clean defense, and we can't walk and hit people. We can't do it. We got to go out there and pitch it clean and field it clean, because that's what they're going to do. Not big strikeout guys for them, but they pitch to contact and they let the defense go to work for them. So we're going to have to play it pretty well. But I do like us to win the series and. Uh, I just – honestly, I think Mississippi State is a better team. And I think that's one of the reasons, too, that they got the regional and got the top eight national seed because everybody sees what State has done, you know, in the non-conference. But also, too, the fact that, you know, State has gone out and played Texas, TCU, and Texas Tech. All three of those were top eight national seeds when it was all said and done. And so, yeah, so if you're looking at Mississippi State and Notre Dame, resume to resume, there's no decision to make. Mississippi State plays – those three Texas powers, and Notre Dame plays Central Michigan and Valpo and their non-conference. And some would argue, well, Steve, they didn't have any RPI building opportunities in the non-conference around them. That's not true. They had Ball State just up the road who was had an RPI of like 50-51. So it wasn't like you had to go play in the Louisiana School of Math and Science. Those are the things that just, again, begin to puzzle me. And, again, it's not the players' fault. It's the administration's fault. And they're the ones that are having to do it. But you know what, Notre Dame? I mean, listen, you're about to get a chance to go play college baseball and have a chance to advance to Omaha in the greatest baseball stadium in the country. All right, let's talk top ten list brought to you by johnnypacker.com. They tell me that their website traffic is way up, thanks to all you guys. I appreciate that very much. Thank you for supporting them. These are Mississippi State folks that are working hard to provide you with a quality product at a reasonable price, and also do a great thing for the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. As I've shared with you guys before, you go look at the website, whatever frames you want, it doesn't matter if it shows sold out or not. If they do, they show sold out, hit that Contact Us link and let them know that we'll get them on order for you. 
They turn it around very, very quickly. Also of note, too, by being a Boneyard listener, we'll save you a little money. Use promo code BONEYARD, and that'll get you 10% off your purchase. And if I told you guys before, a portion of every purchase goes directly to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. John C. Packer himself has struggled with CF his entire life. Now he is trying to use this venue uh, and this venture to provide a higher quality of life for people that suffer with cystic fibrosis. So if you're looking for quality sunglasses, and you absolutely should, these are great sunglasses. They don't pinch your nose. They ride your face well. I've got some here. I can tell you they're grand. So go check them out today, johnnypacker.com, promo code BONEYARD. All right, let's uh, get top 10 lists. I told you guys, too, this is going to be a different list. So we're going to do top rock songs released in the year 2000. And you're going to say, Steve, really? Yeah, yeah, really, because there were some legendary songs from some legendary bands that were just kind of getting started back then that were released that year. And so this was a, I'm going to be honest with you, this was a difficult list to rank. Like, I had a pretty good idea, maybe 15, 16 songs I wanted to include. And then I had to kind of figure out, okay, how do I run down 10 and what's number one? So I tried to go with more towards the end of the list, you know, the the one, two, threes, and fours. I tried to go with songs that really kind of shaped careers. Like some of these songs we're going to talk about, some of these bands had some moderate success. Some of these bands became absolute superstars. And so that's how I decided to rank them. There's a couple of honorable mentions. Let me give them to you. And some of these are just kind of a personal preference. And it is my list after all. And it is my show. And you are my friends. So we just did Lenny Kravitz. And so maybe that's why I didn't want to include Lenny. But I got an honorable mention for Lenny's again, which is a great, great song. We just did Corn too. But I've got Make Me Bad as an honorable mention. Godsmack's Voodoo also makes an honorable mention. I don't think we've done Godsmack yet. I don't think we have. And maybe maybe we should. Uh, Creed's Arms Wide Open. I know some of you guys uh, say you're not Creed fans, but Roy and I would disagree. If memory serves me correct, that's the most listened to uh, playlist that we have. So all you people that don't like Creed sure enjoyed that list. And there's another band many of you may not remember, and that's cool. I love this song. I really liked this band. But I guess one of the things I loved about it is a lead singer had on a Rat Invasion of Your Privacy t-shirt in the video. And it's the band Eve Six, and the song is Promise. And I still rock this regularly. I absolutely love this song. Uh, One day I'll get up and sing at karaoke. absolutely love it. Promise. And some of you guys know them from some of their other work. But Promise is my favorite one. Uh, from Eve Six. All right, so here's your top 10 list. Top rock songs of 2000. Number 10, our good friends down there from Escatawpa, Mississippi, attended Moss Point High School. It's our friends three doors down. Could have gone a couple ways here. I went with Loser. I think Loser is kind of the signature track. I know Kryptonite was the great one that came out. Uh, and Be Like That was great, too. That whole first album was amazing. But I went with Loser for our list. Number 10, Loser, Three Doors Down. Number 9, a band that uh, probably deserves a little more notoriety. And there are some incredible articles about the lead singer of this band because um, he is very eccentric in his thinking. They hit the scene with uh, a song that was absolutely phenomenal called Hey Man, Nice Shot. It's the band Filter. And the song we're going with is Take a Picture, which is arguably their biggest hit. They won several awards for that video, too. Take a Picture by Filter. And again, they have some edgier stuff, but this was clearly their biggest hit. Number eight, a band that uh, we just haven't heard much from in a long time. But man, this song still holds up. I, matter of fact, I've listened to it so much lately, kind of in preparation for this list. The YouTube people play it about every fourth song now. But it's Hanging by a Moment by the band Lifehouse. That is a tremendous song. I absolutely love the writing in it. The music is great. The breakdown is great. There's nothing about that song that I dislike. I I think it is darn near perfect. Hanging by a moment by Lifehouse. Number seven, and this band has kind of lost some favor with rock fans because the new metal movement, of course, is uh, people kind of look back at that kind of like they do uh, 
bell bottom shoes and or bell bottom pants and platform shoes and all that sort of stuff. Uh, they're actually going to be one of the headliners at Rocklahoma this fall. It's a uh, Limp Biscuit, and uh, I went with Roland, which I think is a great track. There's actually two versions of the song. There's the Air Raid version, which is the rock version, and then there is the Urban Assault version that has uh, DMX, Method Man, and Red Man on it, which is incredible. If you don't like the Wu Tang Clan, I don't know if if we can be friends. But uh, so I like the fact there's a couple different versions, uh, but. We're going to go with the Air Raid vehicle version here, uh, Roland. Number six, one of the most popular bands in the history of the world. It's Metallica. And this was a single off the S&M uh, album they did, which is they performed, I guess, with the San Francisco Symphony, and, which is phenomenal. Uh, if you've never watched that and you like Metallica, then you have. You're, what are you doing with your life? But I went with No Leaf Clover. I, I think that is... One of my favorite Metallica songs, I know some of the hardline Metallica fans that just couldn't really embrace that. I, I think it, it is incredible. And uh, I, listen, my buddy Seth McRae and I, when I would go to his house, we always had that album on. We would go by if we had work to do or whatever, or we were just kind of sitting around chilling. We'd have this album on or we'd have that DVD on, and it never got old to me. Number five, a band that I saw at Rocklahoma here a couple years ago, and uh, saw them with a different lead singer a few years before. And you may remember that Chris Daughtry of American Idol was offered the opportunity to be the lead singer for this band when Brent Scallions was on hiatus, and it's the band Fuel. Fuel is a really good band, and uh, they still hold up, they still perform exceptionally well. Brent still has it, uh, can still hit all the notes, and could have gone a few directions with this one too, but I went with their signature track, Hemorrhage, in My Hands, Love Lies Bleeding, In My Hands, Hemorrhage by Fuel is your number five song. These uh, these top four, these were difficult. I knew these songs were going to be the top four, but I wasn't sure how I was going to rank them. And so I, I began to really think about innovation. I began to think about you know how what these bands went on to be. Now, a couple of these bands were already somewhat established in other ways, including number four. It's Maynard James Keenan's first solo project or side project from Tool. It's a perfect circle. have seen them recently, too. Phenomenal band. Absolutely phenomenal. Could have gone with a few of them here. I, I really like the song Three Libras. I love the vibe on that one. But I went with Judith because that opening guitar riff just kind of pulls you in. And I think Maynard's vocals on this are just incredible. It, it's obviously with him singing, it sounds a lot like Tool. But I think it sounds so much different than Tool because of the instrumentation on it. It just is a different deal all the way around. But I love the song, Judith. It still holds up to this day. I mean, we're 20 years later, and they still play it on rock radio around the country. Number three, the one that started it all. And I remember when they used to have those uh, pay-per-view music video stations. You know, like you could call up and you could pay, what, a buck ninety-nine or 99 cents, whatever, and request a video, and they'd play it. It seemed like this one got played all the time when I'd have that much music channel on or whatever when I was working. And I had not really heard of this band, but they were having so much fun on stage. I said, you know what, i got to go out and buy that CD, and I'm so glad I did. I've seen them uh, two or three times now. But it's Papa Roach, and it's the one that started it all. It's Last Resort. And that is one, even to this day, when you go see them live, when Jacoby hits those opening bars, the, the place explodes. It'll give you chills. You feel like you're part of something. Because you know, I think at some point we've all felt like the lyrics in Last Resort. Number two, I've had every one of their, this band's albums, and there weren't enough of them. It's a shame they have not been able to reunite and record new music. I don't fully understand why they ha- it hadn't happened. But it's uh, Rage Against the Machines, Guerrilla Radio. And that's off the Battle of Los Angeles album. And actually, my favorite song on that album is Sleep Now in the Fire. There's not a bad track on that album. I've got all the Rage Against the Machine albums, including the, you know, the remix album where they covered all the rap songs, Renegades of Funk. But Rage, obviously one of the most important bands of my lifetime. And while I don't always support their politics, what I love about Rage Against the Machine is that I felt like our generation was being heard. I think in many ways they were kind of the voice of our generation, and, and people don't fully appreciate that. As I shared with my daughter Mia about why Rage is such a big deal to me, is people forget, you know, they went and played 
two free shows, one across the street from the Republican National Convention and then one across the street from the Democratic National Convention because they wanted to make sure that we were being heard and we wanted to be acknowledged. And it had really nothing to do necessarily with rage, but no, rage helped our generation in many respects become more politically conscious. Even if we didn't become activists, it made us pay closer attention. But I think for a long time people thought, well, that's just something our parents deal with. And I think rage in many respects uh, really encouraged people to get out and go vote and exercise young people uh, to get involved in the political process. And um, I think that's a great thing. And again, Tom Morello, I think, is an, an incredible, <laughs> incredible guitar player. It's um, There's nobody like Tom Morello. There's just not. And again, I don't always agree with all his politics, but his t- his talent is undeniable. And you're probably wondering, well, Steve, what could be number one? And, uh, you know, it's got to be the Pet Shop Boys. No, it's not the Pet Shop Boys. It's not. And I know some of you are thinking, okay, it's, he's going to throw a curveball here. I'm absolutely not. To me, it's the most important band of the early 2000s. It's Linkin Park. Could have gone a lot of ways here, but I went within the end. But I think everybody, I think that's the song that got everybody into Linkin Park. And Chester is gone. And, uh, yeah, it makes me sad. I mean, it's like Linkin Park can never really do, do it again. I mean, it's like, you know, Mike Shinoda says, hey, at some point we're going to do this and do that. It's, uh, it's just really a shame. And, uh, you know, Chester was a guy that was tortured by a lot of things and was never really comfortable in his own skin. And, and Lincoln Park allowed him a chance to kind of process some pain. And uh, one of the things that uh, I watch sometimes when I'm feeling a little bit melancholy is after Chris Cornell died and Chester Bennington uh, was a very good friend of Chris Cornell's, they were on Jimmy Kimmel Live, and rather than play – uh, their new single, Heavy, they elected to play One More Light, which uh, is a song about death. It's about caring about people that are passed on. And uh, when he sang that live, and you can find the video on YouTube, One More Light, live, Lincoln Park, it will give you chills because he breaks down there at the end. And there's a note that he holds where he is just singing his soul out. But um, it's very sad. But uh, the Lincoln Park catalog is very diverse. Of course, they got more industrial and a little more electronic towards the end. Uh, but they were a band, too, with that Hybrid Theory album that really kind of changed things. And they weren't new metal. They were kind of their own thing. That's the thing. I look at bands like them and Rage Against the Machine, uh, that they were bands that kind of carved their own path. And so that's my top ten list. Best rock songs from 2000. And you will notice there are a couple bands that maybe you like that are conspicuously absent. It's because I don't think they're any good. And so I'm, I'm just not going to even acknowledge them by giving them an honorable mention or mentioning the names. I think these bands here, their legacies will endure much longer than some of those other uh, flash-in-the-pan bands uh, that just kind of just profited from the fact that they were, you know, they were fortunate enough to get a record deal and there was enough people at Starbucks that believed that they were, uh, they were talented. Uh, I'm a strange brew guy, and so all due respect to the strange brew folks, uh, I, I don't go to Starbucks, and uh, I don't listen to their, their punk rock either. All right, so let's uh, let's kind of move on from there. Thank you guys so much for all your suggestions. Roy is kind of putting that together. And if you're looking for the list, like a lot of people message me and say, hey, Steve, where's this? You can follow Roy on Spotify at Dogmatic67. That's D-A-W-G-M-A-T-I-C, Dogmatic67. And if you don't do Spotify, just follow him on Twitter, and you can find the list right there. I always retweet them. So... But Roy's not a big tweeter, okay? So it's like if you follow him, he's not going to be spamming your feed with pictures of his food or, you know, he doesn't have videos of him and his dog skiing or anything like that, which would be kind of cool if he did. So if you want to follow Roy, that's cool too. Uh, Make it easier to find those lists. and Because he gets them out sometimes before I have an opportunity uh, to share them with you guys. But I appreciate Roy. had a chance to visit with him and his wife uh, last weekend during the regional, and hopefully we'll get a chance to do it again soon. But... um, that's top 10 list. Really happy with this list. We've been kind of kicking this around for a couple weeks, but um, Roy has got your suggestions, and I've had some people have some really good ones, some non-music ones too, and we'll get to that um, here in the next few weeks. So keep sending those suggestions. Many of you don't, you know, you, you forget we've already done some bands, but d- don't worry about it. Send them anyway, and I'll just let you know if we've already done it, and if need be, I'll even send you the list so you can enjoy that too. But uh, we listen, thank you guys so much. I have so many people that come up to me, you know, at ball games or gas stations or restaurants, or whatever, and say, hey, Steve, I love a top ten list. It's introduced me to a lot of music or reminded me of a lot of music that I used to love. And so uh, that's a wonderful thing. There have been times in my life where music was my only friend. 
And so anytime that I can share tunes with you that are meaningful, I think that's a great thing. And that reminds me too, uh, you know, one of the things we I've considered doing on the show is like give like a new artist of the week or whatever, you know, but I don't want to skew too much toward music. But there was, we do, I do a Facebook live show about once, sometimes twice a week. And- Sugar Ray Leonard, Roberto Duran, Marvelous Marvin Hagler, and Thomas Hearns. Legends, whose four-way rivalry defined one of the greatest eras in boxing history. Relive their decade of dominance in a new Showtime sports documentary, The Kings, a four-part series now streaming on Showtime. Meyer Brand Snacks promise the great value you expect with a quality guarantee in every bite. And summertime snacking is our most favorite snacking season of all, because Meyer Brand makes it deliciously easy. From new lemonade flavors to classic ingredients for backyard s'mores to creamy ice cream varieties like new limited edition purple cow by Meyer Very Berry Americana with ribbons of real strawberry and blueberry swirls waving in creamy vanilla ice cream. Stop into Meyer and discover big taste and bigger savings on Meyer brand summertime snacks. And we do a song of the show. And I was reminded of this great song by this band. I don't even think they're still together anymore, but it's a band called Angels Fall. And there is a kind of a lover's lament song that is so great. It's called uh, Drunk Enough. It's like I'm drunk enough to finally tell you what I I meant to say. It is a great tune. That was our song of the show on the Facebook Live show. And listen, if you want to get involved in that, I do a Facebook Live show again about once a week and uh, answer everybody's questions and that kind of stuff. We interact and have a good time. Go like our Facebook page. That's the Bulldogs 247 Facebook page. That's Bulldogs, D-A-W-G-S, on 247 Sports. And uh, you can keep up with that. So uh, let's move forward and kind of get into Notre Dame here. This segment of the show brought to you by Campus Book Mart. Uh, Listen, I went to um, a book signing at Book Mart and Cafe. And so while I was there, I had a chance to visit with Stan Ray and Miss Kathy Brown. Uh, I didn't see the lovely, talented Susie, so I guess if I want to see her, i got to go over there. I did, however, buy... The Superdog shirts and uh, the regional shirts. Got both of those. And listen, they're great. And so they got gray and they got maroon. And so you've got some options in the colors, but the quality of the shirt is tremendous. And so if you were kind of holding that hope or thinking, hey, on my way into town, I'm going to swing through there and pick up those super regional shirts, the super dog shirts, you can go ahead and do it. Now, these super dog shirts are only available for a limited time. Like this is the only time of the year that you can buy those. They don't make them all year round. It's just specifically made for this time of year because of the fact that we made a super original. It's not licensed the rest of the year. So if you want one of these shirts, you better move pretty quickly because supplies are limited. And again, once they're gone, they're gone. They're not going to be around for Christmas. Okay. So go ahead and move in there and get those shirts. It's a super dog shirts and the regional shirts. Uh, those regional shirts are outstanding. They got the M over S on it. It looks great. Uh, yeah, I, I just I'm I'm always so amazed at what a good job they do uh, through licensing to get these great shirts out there for our, our Mississippi State uh, family. Because there were years and years and years that you know you couldn't get cool shirts about Mississippi State. You just couldn't do it. It just be like two shirts that you could order online. And that'd be it. It's not like that anymore. And I think our fan base in many respects has kind of grown up and, and uh, people are kind of paying more attention to us. But the folks at Campus Bookmart, always ahead of the game. Go by, check them out. And if you can't make it to town, you can order those Superdog shirts or the regional shirts or anything else your heart desires at campusbookmart.net. And by being a loyal Bondyard listener, we'll give you a phrase that pays. And that's BSR, which stands for Beautiful Steve Robertson. And that'll get you free shipping on all orders over 50 bucks. Any order less than $50, absolutely incomplete. That's Again, that's campusbookmart.net. Let's look at the Irish, shall we? Now, we have played more games than them. You know, so the raw numbers are not going to be comparable. But, you know, things like averages and ERA, that stuff's going to be, you know, similar. But you're, you're going to be amazed at how closely matched we are with Notre Dame. Now, I'm going to run some numbers for you here real quick, and then we'll kind of get into the schedule some. Notre Dame is a team hitting 281. Opponents are hitting 241 against them. But let me, let me run this because I think you'll find this interesting. They're hitting 281. Mississippi State is a team. What would you guess? How about 283? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? 
Uh, Mississippi State has stole 65 bases in 80 attempts. Notre Dame has stole 65 bases in 88 attempts. <laughs> now, they're running a little bit higher rate because they play less games, but it's, it, it's, just, it's intriguing to look at those numbers and kind of see it the way that it is. Uh, the Notre Dame team ERA, 3.80. Pretty good, huh? 3.80. The Mississippi State team ERA, 3.87. I mean, it's, it's uncanny. Now, there's some numbers, obviously, when, again, you get into the raw numbers that, that are going to be more favorable to Mississippi State because we have played more games. But when you look at the, those kind of numbers, you begin to look at it and say, you know what, this is, this is pretty decent. One of the things that does kind of stand out, though, is uh, fielding percentage. <laughs> fielding percentage, I don't even think I need to give you the number. I think it's pretty obvious that uh, you guys would know that uh, we haven't always fielded as well as we should have. Um, and we certainly haven't. But fielding percentage, we are 973 as a team, 973. Notre Dame, uh, a good bit better than us. Fielding, looking at their numbers here, fielding percentage as a team is 984. So uh, a big difference for sure. So, you know, they're not going to give us much. You know, they're an athletic team, especially up the middle, and they're not going to – yeah, you know, there's just not going to be a lot of these, uh, you know, balls that get through due to a lack of effort or somebody misreading the baseball. This is a team that really prides itself on defense, and they pitch to contact. So let's get in here and kind of break down what they've done offensively, and then we'll kind of get into their schedule and kind of look at some things that I think that you will find interesting as well. Uh, Ryan Cole leads a team with a 326 average. Eight home runs, 32 ribbies. Uh, he is a guy that does strike out a little bit, but uh, kind of middle the pack for them, you know, 30 for him. Uh, Nico Cavadas, that's the name, uh, obviously, that everybody is kind of paying attention to. Yeah, you know, probably a big leaguer someday. I mean, this is a guy that's got a big power bat, plays first base, hits 309. So he's not just the power hitter. This is a guy that's been walked a lot too, but he's also kind of made the most of his opportunities. 21 dingers, eight doubles. 62 RBI. He's been walked 47 times, which is more than twice anybody else on the team. He's been hit by the pitch five times, and he struck out 50, which is the second highest on the team. So he is kind of a free-swinging guy, but listen, when he connects, it's going to go a long way. It's a big-time guy. So you got to manage that. But here's the deal. You know, our power distribution is uh, a lot more even than theirs because Cavadas has 21, Cole has eight, and then Carter Putts has six, and then it kind of drops off after that. you got, you know, a handful of guys with four or five. But what's interesting, too, is outside of their starting nine, they only got one guy that's got a home run, and he's got one. So they're really kind of dependent on these guys. They just don't seem to have a lot of depth. They don't appear to change the lineup a whole lot. It's kind of put their starting nine out there and kind of run with it. Uh, Carter Putts, of course, another guy that's hitting over 300, 307. Uh, six home runs, 40 RBIs. The best, the best stolen base guy on the team is Spencer Myers, and he has a bit of a hamstring issue. He was injured last weekend, played center field for them, uh, left the game with a hamstring injury, and that is very significant. And so not exactly sure of um, you know, his health. I'm sure that he will play, but there's a good chance that he'll be less than 100%. They didn't talk a lot about that, but I, I kind of keep my ear to the ground. And, uh, you know, we'll see how things progress. I'm sure they've given him treatment all, all week long. But um, that those hamstring things can be stubborn to deal with. And so he is their center fielder and their best stolen base guy. So if he is maybe a half step slow, maybe that you know, reduces the opportunity for them to kind of advance a base there. They do have another guy, too, that's got double-digit steals, and that's Brooks Coetzee, who is 11 of 13. Uh, Brooks also a guy that's in the everyday lineup, has played uh, – 41 games for them out of 44. So that's kind of what the offense looks like there. But, yeah, again, this is a team you know, not just lighting it up offensively, but not a team you look at and say, you know what, they're not scoring. Because you look at what happened last weekend, and it looks more like an anomaly. It really does. And as we run down some numbers, you'll see what I'm talking about here. Again, I think they were angry and motivated, and they're playing at home against less than stellar competition. And the other's no bad teams playing, but I think Notre Dame kind of outclassed, uh, you know, who they played, and I think it shows. 
But, um, you know, th- listen, this is a good team. There's no doubt about it. But they're, they're not a team that you look at and say, you know what, these guys are head and shoulders better than us. It's going to be a very even matchup. And I think being at home makes a big difference. As, a, as, a, as an order here, they have struck out 374 times. You say, well, Steve, what does that mean you know, for us? Well, I'll, I'll kind of put that in perspective for you. Mississippi State struck out 369 times. So, again, it's one of those deals you look at and say, this is, this is absolutely ridiculous. Where State really takes a jump here is on the pitching side of things. For, for those of you that are curious, Mississippi State pitchers have struck out 715 hitters. That's right, 715 hitters. Notre Dame pitchers have struck out 353. So basically half of what Mississippi State has done. And much of the pitching in the ACC is just not a swing and miss is what you get in the SEC. And certainly Mississippi State is the top of the food chain when it comes to that. What is interesting, too, about Notre Dame is much like their offense – They just don't move a lot of guys around when it comes to starts. They kind of go ride their guys. There's a handful of guys that have started some games, and obviously a couple midweek games in there too. But, you know, Will Mercer is a guy that's got 10 starts. John Bertrand's got 13. Aiden Tyrell is a guy that has kind of been in the lineup here as of late. He's got seven starts. There's nobody else on the team that has more than three. So we pretty much have a pretty good idea who we're going to see as far as starters go. This bullpen is uh, is kind of shaky, to be honest with you. They have one guy that pitches a ton, and that's uh, Tanner Kolhap. He's a guy that uh, 22 appearances, he's made one start, got a couple saves. They don't have what you would consider you know, kind of a bona fide closer, but uh, Tanner is kind of that long relief guy. And so he's a guy that actually has uh, the second most innings pitched on the team, and he only has the one start. Yeah, he has pitched a total of you know 57.1 innings, uh, which is more than Mercer and Tyrell. Bertrand is the only guy that's got more. He's got 84 innings pitched, and that's in 13 appearances. You can kind of do the math from there. Looking at their numbers, though, too, as a staff, uh, they basically give up a hit per inning, which is great. They don't walk a whole lot, but they also don't strike out a whole lot. When you look at these numbers here, uh, 178 walks, against a 353 so it's a two to one strikeout to walk ratio Mike Nemeth and I discussed that too he goes yeah I think that's pretty good I said well you really the goal is to be three to one and so they're not and so to kind of look at what Mississippi State has compared to them uh, the numbers are, are awfully interesting to say the least Mississippi State is a staff I've told you you know struck out 715 uh, walk 225 so state you know kind of safely over the three to one thing but when you begin to look at the starting numbers here they just jump off the page. Will Bednar, 109 Ks against 18 walks. That is ridiculous. I mean, that is, that's video game type numbers there. Christian McLeod, even though he's had some struggles with control at time, 106 Ks against just 27 walks. You know, where we've had issues has been, when, you, know, when, you know, some of our younger guys kind of skews things a little bit. But when you look at the numbers of our main line guys, the strikeout-to-walk ratio is just incredible. Uh, looking at Brandon Smith's numbers, he has been sometimes unfairly maligned by our fan base, 38 Ks to just nine walks on the year. You know, so he's basically 4-1, to one, a little bit over 4-1, to one, to be honest with you. Uh, Stone Simmons, a guy that has pitched for us barely, we've been pretty good down the stretch, 27-7. and seven. Houston Harding has had some issues at times. He's got 55 Ks against 15, but you know, you look again, it's over three to one. If Parker Stinnett is down a little bit, uh, Landon Sims, as you guys know, 78 and 13. I mean, so you know, we're striking out a whole lot more than we're walking. They're not. Uh, we're allowing 221, about an average of 221 against our pitching as a staff. It's a little different over at Notre Dame. It's 241. So opponents are hitting 20 points higher against them. Does that make a big difference? It's probably a hit or two per game. And I think in this as evenly matched as these two teams are, that's going to make a difference. Defensively, they're a little bit better than us. So we're going to have to play exceptionally clean. I think pitching-wise, we're better than them. And I think we clearly have more depth. And I think offensively, basically what you've got to do is 
you can't let Cavadas beat you. You got to make somebody else beat you. And listen, they've got some good players. I'm not taking anything away from them, but they're not going to be better than anything that we've seen in a Southeastern Conference. They're just not. There's nothing here that really jumps off the page except for the defensive numbers and the fact that they just don't have a lot of depth in that bullpen. And so once we get in there, and I'm, I'm sure, listen, game one means everything, right? So, you know, I'm sure they're going to throw their best guy and then have Cole Heap ready to go. But, but, but if for some reason you can get into this pen, I mean, there's some guys here that have some huge ERAs that have thrown some pretty big innings for them. Uh, Joe Sheridan is thrown 41 innings. He's got a 5.27 ERA. Uh, Dominic Cancellari, 6.60. Alex Rayo is a guy that's been pretty good for him. Liam Simon has been decent for him. But there's just not a lot of guys in that pen that have big innings because they just kind of ridden the starters and then let you know, Cole help kind of clean it up there. So uh, I feel good about where we stand. I think the bottom line is, is we just got to go out there and play Mississippi State baseball. If we go out there and play within ourselves – and do what we always do, we're going to win this series. And, again, I think we can win it two games. I can't say I'm expecting that, and maybe that's just because I'm a little bit nervous because I know what's at stake, a birth to Omaha. But I just can't see them beating Will Bednar. And if McLeod is on, I can't see them beating McLeod. What does concern me is they have some left-handers. And so, you know, we have struggled at times with left-handers, and that's what we always tell ourselves is, hey, you know, we hit left-handers better. That's not always the case. The splits don't always prove that. But we got to go up there looking backside, you know, all these left-handers. And, you know, we got to keep Luke Hancock in lineup. I think you've got to keep Kellen Clark in there. But you've got to find a way to put the ball in play. I, I don't think these are going to be lopsided ball games. I think these are going to be like four to two, uh, three to one type ball games. I, I don't think that there's going to be a lot of runs scored. Now, now, of course, things can always change. But I just think the fact that they are so good defensively and we're so good on the hill – we're going to kind of neutralize some offense, and I think that's going to be a big part of things. Basically, you know, the team that makes the first big mistake is going to be in a lot of trouble. Now, a lot of guys have been all week long, and it's like as soon as we get the ball game over on Sunday, everybody's already posting their weather reports. So there, on Saturday, there is a 40% chance of rain. We have had rain forever, absolutely forever. And you know what? We're going to have a bunch more on Friday. But by the time we get ready to play a ball game, hopefully the rain's going to be gone. It is supposed to be partly sunny on Sunday and then sunny on Monday. And um, hopefully that drives some things up. And people ask, okay, what about the quality of the field? Hey, we're going to be fine there. We've got the state-of-the-art drainage system. We had the best grounds crew in the country. So the field will be ready. Will it be a little bit soft? Probably so. I mean, we've had a lot of rain in the Starkville area. I think that this evening is the first time it's really slowed down uh, since we, we got done with the ball game on Monday. I mean, it has absolutely poured uh, much of the week. But I've got a lot of confidence in our crew. I have no doubt that they'll be, it'll be up to a championship standard since that's the buzzword this year when it comes to NCAA tournament events. But I like us to win. I, I, I do. I just, I've, I've looked at this and looked at this. I've talked to Mike Nemeth and talked to other people. And I just think it's as simple as this. You don't let Cavadas beat you. You don't, and you go out there and play your game, and you, and you don't beat yourself, and you're going to win this series, and you're going back to Omaha. I think it is that simple. Uh, I do think Mississippi State is the better team. I think Mississippi State has played better competition. And let's run that down real quickly before we move on. So, as I've mentioned before, too, it was a good year in ACC, not a great year. And a lot of that, too, of course, is because, uh, you know, Everybody had to schedule a little bit different, but uh, not a lot of ACC teams in the tournament. Miami makes the field, of course. They went and played in the Florida Regional, Florida State, made the field, played in the Ole Miss Regional, North Carolina, uh, went out to Lubbock and played in the Texas Tech. Of course, all three of those teams eliminated. NC State is in, of course, they're playing in the Arkansas uh, region. Duke went to Knoxville and got beat. And so, and then there's, there's Notre Dame. And so there's not a lot of ACC teams left. I guess there's three because Virginia made it, uh, and they're in, obviously. So they're still playing. So, again, not a lot of comparison. I think you can look at and say, well, you know, it's, um, it's kind of like the SEC. The teams that you expected to make it did. I don't think there was anybody. Maybe North Carolina was a little bit of a surprise to get in. But it wasn't a great year. And so let's look at the Notre Dame schedule real quickly here and just kind of see how they did 
against some of these uh, teams that did make the tournament. And, of course, they did play Central Michigan in the non-conference, and then they played them in their regional. Uh, probably not fair to Central Michigan, but, uh, you know, fire up chips. Best luck to you guys. So let's run it down real quick here. We talked about earlier in the year about um, them canceling so much stuff. Uh, they they take two out of three from Wake Forest. Nothing good happens for Wake this year. They take two out of three from Clemson. Clemson doesn't make the tournament. They sweep Virginia, who is in a super regional. So that's one of those things that kind of raises an eyebrow. And, of course, UVA kind of up and down. They take two out of three from Duke. And, listen, all these games are competitive. That's the thing you look at. Like, the Duke game, Duke, of course, didn't survive uh, out in Knoxville, didn't play well at all. But it's a 6-4 win in 13. It's a 6-2 game, and then they lose game three, 2-0. They, uh, they, take, they take two from uh, Louisville. And, again, games are competitive, 5-3, 7-4. They take two out of three from Pitt on the road, 4-1, 3-2, and then they win the Sunday game, 11-5. They got after Georgia Tech pretty good, though. Took two out of three. But it's a 10-9 ball game, a 7-0 game, and they lose a 4-2 game, losing on Sunday, losing that game three. We look at the NC State. We know what those guys have done, right? It's a 3-2 ball game. They lose 5-2, and then they win the Sunday game 11-2. They take two out of three from Boston College. They sweep North Carolina, who made the field and probably shouldn't have. Uh, those games, you know, one of them's thirteen to twelve, but they, you know, they gave up a lot of runs. You know, Florida State that was a, a, that was a loud loss there. Florida State really kind of a middle of the pack ACC team this year. You know, they went to to Oxford and played, and the Ole Miss people lost their minds because they're a college baseball blue blood, but they weren't good this year. They're pretty mediocre, but they went into South Bend and they took two out of three. They beat the Irish 5-2. They lose 5-3, and then they beat them 7-1 on Sunday. Again, there's the Sunday thing again. There's the game three thing again. Virginia Tech, that was uh, the last series for them. They swept out. And Virginia Tech, obviously, uh, a team that, you know, not very good this year. Then they had the round robin thing, and uh, they beat Virginia Tech for a fourth straight time. And then Virginia beats them 14-1. Absolutely destroyed Notre Dame in that ball game. And you know, kind of looking at the numbers here, uh, it wasn't a situation, you know, where, you know, Notre Dame went out there and, and just kind of threw a midweek guy. And you know, one could argue, too, you know, if we're not going to think about Hoover, we can't we think about the, the ACC tournament as well. But they threw Bertrand in that game. Now, Bertrand was the starter, and they threw, threw uh, Tanner Colehope. So they threw their best two arms in that ball game. Uh, Bertrand... Goes one inning, gives up five runs. They bring in Cole Heap, and uh, then he goes three and two-thirds, gives up three runs. And then after that, they're just kind of managing the ball game, trying to get it over with. And so it just it wasn't a good outing for those guys. So I don't know how much you can carry from that, but they did kind of redeem themselves, much like Mississippi State did once they got into their regional. And this is the thing that jumps out to me is how few runs they gave up. It's not the runs scored to me that jumps up. It's the runs allowed. It's a it's a ten nothing ball game, a twenty six to three ball game, and a fourteen to two ball game. Now, granted, they played Central Michigan, Connecticut, and Central Michigan. And yet, that you know, can you imagine what Central Michigan looked like coming back out of losers bracket? What kind of pitching was available for them? So. I just don't know if you can draw any conclusions on Notre Dame based on the South Bend Regional, and that's not to disrespect them in any way. I just think the quality of competition was not good. The fact that they didn't play Michigan says a lot about the the available competition out there. Uh, Michigan not very good. Central Michigan, of course, not nearly as good as they were a couple years ago. You know, I really thought UConn had a chance to go in there and pull the upset, and they got absolutely drilled. So, you know, let's kind of move forward with this. But I I think it's better – to kind of look at Notre Dame in its entirety rather than look at last weekend. And it kind of reminds me of how a lot of our fans looked at VCU. You know, VCU goes out there and beats up on Campbell, and we're thinking, oh, my gosh, they're going to go out there. I mean, I had guys in the media saying, oh, they're going to tee off on Christian McLeod. And they didn't. We went out there and skull drugged them. You forget the game? We have to destroy those guys. And so I think this is a similar situation where sometimes, you know, because we want to win so bad, 
we allow this to kind of mess with our anxiety. We think, you know what, maybe they're better than us. They're not better than us. They might be as good at us in some areas, but we're the better team and we're playing at home. One of the things I think is interesting, too, when I look at these Notre Dame numbers, if you can scroll through yourself and you start looking at some of these crowd sizes, it'll blow your mind. It'll absolutely blow your mind, uh, the difference in the crowd sizes. And let me just, I'm, Let's just go to that Florida State series, and I'm going to pull these box scores up, and we'll look at these before we move on. We'll get, do some football recruiting stuff before we get out of here. But, you know, looking at these numbers, it is, it is ridiculous to, to think about you know, kind of what we have and then, you know, what they played in front of. It, it, is, uh, it is rather interesting, to say the least. So Notre Dame, you know, hosted Florida State for that big series. You know, Florida State obviously was a uh, top 15 team at the time. Notre Dame was ranked second in one poll, Florida State 13. And just so you know, this is, again, this is in South Bend. They had 358 people show up. 358. That's game one of that series. Game two... After they had won, they have a chance to go clinch a series against a top uh, top 15 opponent. 302 people show up for the ball game. 302. The Sunday game, which was the you know the rubber game, and again this is in South Bend, Indiana. <laughs> it's amazing, it really is. 302 people come to see that game too. If we had gone up there and played, we would have taken over that stadium, man. It's like. I look at this stuff and I almost laugh about it. It's like, oh, yeah, we deserve to do this. We deserve to do that. We ought to host. Man, you guys can't even get your own students to come to the games. So why, why would anybody else come? I mean, it's like it doesn't make any sense for the NCAA to put a, to put a super regional up there. Not just, because, not just because of the non-conference stuff, but just from an economic standpoint. It's incredible to think about that. And let's look real quickly at the regional crowds because, you know, there were some people that came from the other schools. And um, So let's look at the, the Central Michigan game one, opening game of the regional, June 4th. 1,825 people. 1,825. Guys, we have more than that on a Tuesday against Mississippi Valley State. Against Connecticut, obviously a big game. Attendance, 1825. A chance to win this thing, right? A chance to win it outright, get to the Super Regional and go prove everybody wrong. And again, it's 1825. So I'm sure that's just their paid attendance. Probably not even the actual attendance. And then they're going to come up here and play in front of 12, 13,000 people and not expect it to be a difference? You're kidding yourself, guys. Absolutely kidding yourself just amazing to me that i think there are a lot of people out there it's, it's, it's almost like i joke with you guys like early in the year when i was traveling for baseball and i used to come on the show and i would say you know guys i don't think you guys understand that we in mississippi are living a different experience than most of the country when it comes to mask and that sort of stuff that's the same kind of shock that i think these people are going to get from from notre dame it's like oh well, it's just baseball no it's it's not just baseball you're coming down here playing a team that's gone to Omaha two years in a row, and, and you have been, what, two times in your history? You know, it's a much different dynamic. And I, I think they're a little bit naive and, like, get in the media and say this, some of the things they've said. And now all of a sudden there's going to be 12, 13,000 people, Nico, they're going to be riding you. You know, before, I mean, you go look at what you know, Campbell and those guys came in here and showed some respect and played the game hard and – you know, we love him. There's not going to be a lot of love for that guy. It's just not. And and to be honest with you, I don't know if there should be. I mean, you come out there basically say, we're going to go to Mississippi State and we're going to sweep them. No matter how many people are there, we're going to take, we're going to go 2-0 and at Mississippi State. We're going to go, we will find a way to go 2-0 and at Mississippi State. That's what he said. No, nobody made, made him say it. That's what he said. I just think that's... When you're already on the road and you're going into an environment you have never experienced before, that was really, really, really stupid. All right, listen, if you're going to make the move to Starkville, there's no other place to look than Portico. Listen, there's a lot of people that will say, hey, Steve, look at this place, look at that place. No, no, no. 
if I was moving to Starkville, I would go to Portico. I, I want the newest, nicest thing, and the fact that it's so close to campus is incredible. There are a lot of great places around town. There are. A lot of great places to live, a lot of neighborhoods that you can you know, turn your kids loose or whatever and you can feel really good. Uh, but listen, they're not within a mile of campus. Portico, 1.1 miles from campus, man. That's how close it is. If you're a runner, you can run over there and go. You can take the kids over there and, hey, we'll, we'll go up there and you know, we'll walk around campus together. We'll go walk by the football stadium, get a little exercise. It's all right there. You know, listen, you've been here before. You folks have come in off 25 and you got to fight all that traffic on 12 to get to campus. It's not always had a lot of fun on game day. I mean, it gets you fired up, but I'm ready to get there. You know, other people go the back way, and other people take 82. How cool would it be to live here and be that close to Mississippi State, to all things maroon? Portico is the way to go. And I believe there's two houses left in phase one. Got all the permits now to get all the dirt moved and roads built. Phase two, we're about to get that thing popped up too. But if you're looking to make a move, there's no better place than Portico. It's right there off of, if you cross Old West Point Road on Garrett Road, you know where the Chrysler dealership is right there when you come into town? It's behind there. It's right there. It couldn't be any better. And listen, if you're if you're the one in the family that says, hey, listen, one day we need to make this happen, you need to take charge of this and call Brooks Bryan today. Call Brooks and just get some information. That's all you need. You're not making a commitment. You're not making a down payment. There's no earnest money required. We're just two people talking, right? You call Brooks and say, listen, Brooks, we're not ready to make a move yet, but I'd like to get some information. I've heard Steve talk about this on the show, and I'm going to tell you it's fantastic. You owe it to yourself to go by and look, which will even get you more fired up about moving here. But just, just call Brooks and say, Brooks, I just want to get some information, and you can have what you need before you even call a real estate agent, before you call your bank, sit down with your significant other and say, listen, this is what I want to do. I've already talked to Mississippi State Baseball Royalty Brooks Bryan, my great friend Steve Robertson. He said, hey, listen, this is a move we can make. And then you bring all of us in there together, right? You have my endorsement, you've got Brooks's endorsement, and you're going to be well healed for the discussion. Let me give you the number to call so you can get this thing started today. I mean, there's just absolutely no reason not to. Two bedroom, two bedroom, two bedroom, two bath, four bedroom, four bath, got the walk-in trail, everything you need. And, man, again, Mississippi State's basically in your backyard. There's nothing better than that, man. There's nothing – I can tell you from living here, there's nothing better than being able to go to ball games whenever I want to. Brooks's phone number, 601-416-8075. Again, that's 601-416-8075. You got nothing to lose by making a phone call. You got nothing. Pick up the phone today, call Brooks, and say, hey, listen, we've been thinking about this for a while. We just want to get some information. No commitment. Let's get the ball rolling, people. All right? I need you up here. We need more Bulldogs up here. You'll be so glad you're here. Your kids are going to be happier here because then they can go to Walmart like running to Jake Mangum or something. Right? Let's go. All right, let's talk a little recruiting before we get out of here. I've got to go to bed here soon. That's one of the reasons I'm recording a little bit earlier because we've got to get up and go to camp, football camp. Uh, it's not going to be what it was last Friday, but listen, the staff's done a pretty good job kind of staging some of these things out you know, to make sure that uh, – they have a chance to spend quality time with guys. Last Friday, of course, you know, Top Dog Camp. I, I'm, it'll always be Big Dog Camp to me. I, I, I don't like the name Top Dog Camp. It makes it sound like it's the Westminster Dog Show or something that we're first in show, whatever. No, we're the, we're the big dogs. Big Dog Camp, that's what, that's what it should be called, and that's what I'm going to call it. So we had Big Dog Camp last Friday. All the stars kind of came out, just about everybody was here. But there were some other guys that couldn't make it. Like uh, Case and Henry, offensive lineman out of Georgia. It's really between us and North Carolina. He's uh, headed to Ole Miss one day this weekend and then headed to Mississippi State. Ole Miss hadn't offered him yet, but he'll be here with us. And listen, for a long time, it's basically been a state-UNC battle. I do feel like state is chasing UNC, and I think at some point, because of the fact that now state's got, you know, you've got, you've got a couple guys already lined up now. You, know, you can have a sense of urgency, and you can say, hey, listen, i got you know, a handful of guys out here that are thinking about committing. You know, so I, you know, it's time for me to kind of know what you're going to do or at least have an idea of, of what we're doing, you know, if we're going to continue a relationship together. Uh, so we've talked about Bryson Hurst a lot from Gauthier. Listen, I, I was told that he was very, 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 very close to committing to Mississippi State last Friday night and then just felt like, you know, I think his dad was with him, say, listen, 
Before we do anything, I want to get mom up here and let her ask her questions about academics and things like that. And of course, you can call them, but it's just different. You know, mom needs to come and listen. We've all got a mama, right? Mama wants to know where her baby's going to lay her head. And so mom needs to come up, and I understand that's going to happen here in the next couple of weeks. I'm not exactly sure when he makes the call. I do think it is sooner rather than later. He is expected to go to a camp at Florida State, and then I think they'll arrange that visit you know, for, for him to come back with his mom and have an opportunity to have her questions answered. And I think shortly after that, I think we'll have a commitment. I really do. Now, Cam East is the guy we've talked about a lot. Uh, Cam is the guy that wants to play in a Southeastern Conference. He's at a St. Augustine High School there in New Orleans. Interesting situation for a while. It felt like we were chasing Arkansas. Arkansas has a change of the offensive line coach. Of course, LSU fires James Craig. And then he hired the the, uh, offensive line coach from Arkansas. So now all of a sudden Arkansas is kind of on the back burner again. And he's headed to TCU this weekend. He wants to take a visit to Virginia. But he's not going to go to those places. This is a guy that, listen, many of these kids hadn't been anywhere in two years. And we forget that sometimes too. He's like, well, yeah, they can finally go see it's their year. They didn't get to go anywhere last year. So these guys that are going to be upcoming seniors this time last year, it wasn't just the seniors that uh, had to stay home. They couldn't go to ball games. They couldn't come to junior day. They couldn't come to senior summer camps. And so they're kind of making up for lost time. So I think you're going to have a lot of guys take more visits this year. I think that's just – there's going to be some guys that want to be recruited because they haven't been. They haven't seen a college coach on their campus in two years. They hadn't had anybody come to their spring practice or spring game and watch them play. They hadn't had a chance to interact with these guys. So I think many of these guys are going to kind of slow the process down a little bit. And so as a result, they're going to take these trips. And I think Cam Meese is one of those guys. Cam, Listen, Cam's not going to go to Virginia. I don't even think he would go to TCU. I think he's going to be reasonably close. But also, too, he has expressed more than once he wants to play in a Southeastern Conference. And so now that Arkansas is out and the coach that was at Arkansas uh, is now at LSU, and you'd say, okay, well, then, then maybe that means LSU is going to go ahead and offer him. You know, from what I understand, LSU has kind of told him, and said, hey, listen, we'll be honest, you're kind of down our board a little bit. That's not, that doesn't mean that LSU won't come back on him late. But I think by that time, maybe it's, it's too late. I've always said that the two places you can beat LSU for kids – is in New Orleans and in the Arkletax. And, of course, Arkletax is up there around the Shreveport area where Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas come together, thus the Arkletax, because those kids are so far removed from campus. Many of them have never even been to a ball game at LSU. But kids in New Orleans are a little more self-aware, so they're not always guaranteed to go to LSU. So this could be a guy that I believe that, um, you know, if LSU decided to come back on him late, I think, I think they could have a little trouble here. I don't ever count them out. But they've already got a handful of guys committed and a couple tackles already committed at LSU. And so it's like, okay, well, how many tackles are they going to take within your own class? And so I think State would have a good chance to get him. And I, I really don't think LSU is going to come back and offer him late. I really don't. I, I always worried about that with Malik Neighbors. Of course, that's the guy that flipped from us to LSU on signing day last year. I felt all the way through that if LSU ever offered him and got serious about him, that we were going to be in trouble. That's exactly what happened. You know, they, they pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed, and they didn't do anything. And then late on National Signing Day, they had convinced him not to sign with State until after the, he had heard back from them because they had a linebacker commitment they were worried about. And he flipped to Alabama, so then they gave his scholarship to Malik Neighbors. And so I don't think this will be a similar situation, though. I just don't think that LSU is as high on Cam East as they were Malik Neighbors, if that makes sense to you. It's not just because of the fact that the kid's in New Orleans. I just think that he is a guy that's just not as high on their board as a guy like Malik Neighbors. And even Malik, you know, had to have somebody else fall out in order for him to get in. And so I feel good about the direction of the class right now. And, listen, a lot of people are – you know, there's been some changes in the 247 sports composite because the ESPN arrivals have ranked some kids. I'm not even worried about any of that. There's not anybody in this class I would throw back we still got 10 spots to work with. I'm excited about the options we have out there. And really what we're going to sign the rest of the class is going to basically define the ranking. I still believe it's going to be a top 20 class, some think top 15. I don't know if I go that far. I think we end up around 17, 18 maybe. 
but I like this class. I like the energy I'm seeing from our, our coaches. Uh, I, I love talking to the kids, and they're like, oh, yeah, that, you know, you know Darcel McBath is my boy. Mason Miller is my guy. You know, they, they talk about Dave Nichol. Dave Nichols, the guy that's always on me. You know, and it's not one or two guys. You know, there's been some times in the past you'd say, well, you know, our best recruiters are these guys. I just think it's a collective effort. I mean, there just, just is. I mean, there's, just, there's not a guy on this staff that you look at and say they're not putting forth the effort. There are some guys obviously better recruiters than others. But I don't think this is a situation like we've had, it, like even at times under Coach Kroom. You know, we had, you know, some guys out there, you know, guys like Reed Stringer and J.B. Grimes that were really beating the bushes and doing a great job, Rocky Felker. You know, and there were some other guys out there that were kind of spinning their wheels a little bit. You know, Ellis Johnson, great guy, not a great recruiter. You know, he'd go out there and get him a kid from uh, Lincoln High School there in Tallahassee, Florida, uh, get his one guy per year and be done. You know, there just, there just wasn't a lot of that. And he was involved, obviously, when guys came to campus. But we just didn't have the same brand of recruiters. And that's the thing that I think these guys kind of took it personally when, you know, it was kind of like, well, they don't recruit well. And, listen, they were trying to recruit to Pullman, Washington, the most remote outpost in the Pac-12. I think that was a bigger issue. I think they, they kind of sharpened us all a little bit there and said, hey, we got to work a little bit harder than everybody. Well, now they're here. They're working just as hard, but there are more prospects within the recruiting footprint to pull from. So, as a result, you're seeing high-ranking high, high ranking classes and what you've seen historically under Mike Leach. I'm excited about it. You should be as well. Uh, listen, I don't know if you guys are aware. I have a new book out. It came out on Monday, and uh, I was informed a couple days ago that uh, in its first week of release, it is going to debut on the Mississippi bestsellers list, which means more to me than I can ever say. Uh, All four of my books have been on there, and uh, it's not necessarily because I wrote them. Of course, that's a big part of the process, but it's because you guys go and buy them. Blooms of Oleander, available through Amazon, uh, through Books a Million, Barnes & Noble. But listen, I would prefer you buy it through an independent bookstore or a Mississippi bookstore. You can go to Lemuria Books and buy it. You can go to... uh, Book Martin Cafe downtown in Starkville and buy it. If, if you want signed copies, Book Martin Cafe is the only one that has them right now. I will get down to Lemuria and sign their stock. But right now, that's the only place to get it. So if you order online, they're not going to be signed. I'm just going to tell you that right out of the gate. They're not going to be signed. Uh, so order from Book Martin Cafe. But you can buy from your local bookstore, too. So you just go in there and tell them, I need to get Steve Robertson's Blooms of Oleander. And, uh, and they can order it. And, uh, and you can have it. And so, again, I'm a big proponent of supporting independent bookstores, whether they be in Mississippi or elsewhere. But we have some fine ones here in the state of Mississippi, and, and I always want to support them whenever we can. Uh, if you're looking for Father's Day gifts, let me encourage you. Go to StarkVillains.com. Order Dad a Stark Villain shirt. He'll be glad you did. But also, too, get him some read material. Go to AlphaDogsTheBook.com, and you can get personalized copies of Flim Flam, Stark Villains, and Alpha Dogs. Many of you have been putting it off, and, I, and there's so many people that come – They'll see me and say, hey, Steve, I got two of your books. Well, you need to get the other one, too. Oh, it's like I got Stark Villains. Well, if you like Stark Villains, you're going to love Alpha Dogs. Well, I got Alpha Dogs. Should I go back and read Stark Villains? You absolutely should. And I've had somebody ask me recently and said, Steve, of all your books, which, which are you the most proud of? And it's a difficult. It's like picking my favorite kid, you know. But I would probably say Stark Villains. And then when I say that, there are people like, oh, my gosh, I like Alpha Dogs that much more. One of the things I love about Stark Villains is all the history about Mississippi State. You know, kind of like how Mississippi State came to be. I learned a lot. Now, the Alpha Dogs, I think there are probably some better stories. What I mean by that is, you know, I got Harper Davis talking about um, Alan McKean. You know, that's, that, and that story can never be told again. You know, God rest his soul, you know. And so, and then I got, you know, the story about, you know, the game of change, you know, interviewing, you know, Bill Anderton about that, you know, and then getting the documents, all the telegrams and the things that the, the State College Board had to deal with. I mean, there's some, there's some amazing history in that book as well. And so, if you love Mississippi State, and I'm not just saying this because I wrote these books, I worked extremely hard on them, but these, this is the Mississippi State story. And so if you love Mississippi State and you love hearing the stories, uh, you know, in the words of the people that live through them, then Stark Villains and Alpha Dogs are going to work for you. And, of course, uh, you know what Flim Flam is about. If you hadn't read it, you should. It's been great. It's been a lot of fun. And i got some more cool things coming with that in the, uh, in the months to come. I still can't talk about it. I wish I could, but I can't. But uh, really proud of Blooms of Oleander. 
it uh you know it's 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 one of those things that feels more like my baby because i I basically did all this myself and there's a couple things grammatically i missed in the in the edit drives me crazy but it's not anything that affects the reading the book it's just a little something small most of you won't even catch it but drives me crazy but you know you live and learn but i learned a lot about myself because i didn't have anybody to kind of bail me out when i made mistakes i had to kind of figure that stuff out on my own and um really proud of the work and uh, very grateful for the reviews I've gotten already. There have been so many people that have reached out and said, Steve, I never knew you had this in you. And I'd say, well, you know, maybe I guess because of the, all the sports stuff, you know, you, you think that's kind of who I am and all I am, and it's not. I'm, I'm a guy that, uh, you know, I love a lot. And um, like the people say, you know, it's, you know, you, you love with a big love. I, I do. I, I love I love people. And uh, I've loved a lot of people in my life, and sometimes it worked out and uh most of the time it didn't so i wrote about some of that stuff too and so i uh, wrote about my dad who i love and miss incredibly and uh it's hard for me to believe he's been gone for nearly 16 years now it just absolutely blows my mind and he would be so incredibly proud of what has happened in my life since then and that that drives me and it's one of the things i share with people too and i had a chance to share with a young man last week about this sort of thing you know it's like when I go watch Mississippi State play baseball, it's like I know that he's there. If that makes sense. And I don't want to get too deep and philosophical with you guys, but it's like when I go to Mississippi State baseball game, I know some I know somehow, some way he is there, that his energy is there, that he is watching over that game because that's that's what he loved. And so when I go, and maybe that's one of the reasons I go as much as I do, it kind of gives me a chance to get away from all this. And, and there are some times when I'll, I'll make that turn – going between duty noble and the hump and there's almost sometimes i can almost just feel it you know because i just know after a big ball game which is so many times i think to myself how much my dad would love this and so with father's day coming up let me encourage you uh, to kind of talk a little bit about those sorts of things you know i appreciate your dad but let me just share with you you hear it all the time but you know forgive 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 you know whatever is going on in your life forgiveness is a gift you give yourself but there's just there will come a time when you're not going to be able to mend any fences. And listen, I know some of them are are so incredibly broken that uh, maybe you can't find any common ground to move forward and have any kind of relationship. But I'm just going to tell you, life is too short and death is too certain to live with bitterness and resentment in your heart. And I did that for a long time in my life. And so that's what sobriety has kind of taught me is that, you know, kind of moving on from some of that stuff, and not that my dad and I have a bad relationship. That's not what I'm, I'm suggesting. I'm just I know that there are some people that I love that have those types of relationships. But, you know, I just think, again, you've got to figure out what's more important to you in life. And I just, I would rather be, I would rather be relatable and I would rather be aligned and I would rather be forgiven and I would rather have a relationship than be right. That's just, there's nobody in my life that I would want to lose over me being right. It's just not important to me. Being right is not important to me. And so maybe you don't share that philosophy, and maybe you're just not there yet, or maybe you've moved beyond that, and you just think, you know what, I'm, I'm perfectly okay, because I know there are some people that have uh, you know, some toxic relationships. You don't need to revisit. I, I respect it. But if you're one of those folks that, uh, you know, maybe you've got some stuff between you that can be easily resolved with a phone call and maybe ego is the thing that's preventing you from making it, I can tell you that one of the most beautiful things that ever happened in my life is I was with my dad when he passed away. And I was able to, I had my hand on his, on his arm as he took his final breath. And I, I consider that one of God's greatest gifts to me. And I think it's important that... Um, I think it was important for him that I was there to help him through that. And so that is one of those things that I look back in my life and I'm most proud of, that I was so grateful that I was there, but also, too, that I could help him uh, kind of move on uh, you know, to the, to the next life. And so I didn't plan to get all preachy and, and run this show so long, but uh, you know, in the spirit of Father's Day, I've been thinking about him a lot lately. And so you know, I love my kids, and I'm so glad they all had a relationship you know, with him, and I'm glad he was able to sow some seeds in their life. My dad's the greatest man I've ever known, and I'm sure most of us feel the same way about their, about their dads. But it's amazing to me that I can go out and go to the ball games, and I'll have somebody come up and say, "It wasn't Freddie Roberts and your dad." I say, "Yeah, sure was," and everybody has a story. You know, sometimes they're really funny, but 
that means so much to me when people that knew my dad come up and say, you know what, Steve, your dad will be really proud of you. It means more than I can really ever, ever say. Just because there are so many people that have come up to me that have a story, you know, that my dad helped them with this or helped them with that. And uh, I'm glad that uh, I'm part of that legacy and I'm glad that I'm his son. So I hope that you, uh, whatever, whatever's wrong in your life, I hope you can fix it. I really do. Let me get out of here. I'm starting to ramble a little bit. I love all you guys incredibly, and I want you to have a great weekend. And I hope come Monday we're celebrating our chance to go to Omaha because I would love to take the show on the road and be able to record for you guys again in Omaha like I did two years ago. But let's get out of here. But until next time, let's all live our lives in a way we make more friends than enemies and people can see a difference in the way we live. Sugar Ray Leonard, Roberto Duran, Marvelous Marvin Hagler, and Thomas Hearns. Legends, whose four-way rivalry defined one of the greatest eras in boxing history. Relive their decade of dominance in a new Showtime sports documentary, The Kings, a four-part series now streaming on Showtime.